Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show. I'm your host, Deborah Kozowski, and today I am excited to bring to you a special guest. She just launched her book. Throughout her career, Jackie Insinger has brought her expertise in cognitive psychology and interpersonal dynamics to the business world as a sought-after executive and team dynamics coach. Using her research-based, action-oriented methodology, Jackie helps leaders and teams focus on unique strengths and authentic connection in order to increase performance, results, fulfillment. Her positive psychology-led framework, Platinum Leadership, has been a game-changer for thousands of people and businesses throughout the world. Jackie has a psychology degree from Duke University, a master's in human development and psychology from Harvard, and she is a member of both the Forbes Coaches Council and the Harvard Business Review Advisory Council and lives in Denver with her husband, Rob, and two sons, Simon and Miles, and an enormous Newfoundland, Haley, aka Big Nazi. <laughs> How cool is that? And I forgot to ask you before the show about your family. Yep. Yep. We've got great nicknames. So Big Nasty is our Newfoundland's nickname and had to make it on the, you got to insert personality, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm excited to have you here and, you know, positive psychology and mindset are really um, foundational in the Millionaire Woman Show because we talk a lot about life, business and leadership and how those principles help people live rich from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about is you've just launched this brand new book. I'm excited that I had an opportunity to jump in and already get into reading it. And, you know, one of the biggest things is, and it's so simple, mm -hmm. is that you start with, it all begins with you. Yes. Yet at the same time, sometimes that's the harshest truth anyone can face. <laughs> yeah. So I'd love for you to share with us a little bit about, you know, what got you started in writing Spark the Brilliance, Spark Your Brilliance. Because, you know, I don't know if people think of themselves necessarily as being brilliant mm -hmm. and what it takes to recognize some of those gifts inherently, what you have inside yourself. So what got me to that? Okay, that's a great question. There's so many angles I could take to answer that one. Um, I, you know, I've been fascinated with positive psychology since it emerged back in 1998. And that's when I was in graduate school and it was coming out and I was studying, you know, interpersonal dynamics and psychology. And I've always had, um, an optimistic lean, right? Always focused on, well, how do we reframe this? What's the opportunity? What's the positivity? What's the other lens on this? And so it just so naturally um, fit my, my desires, this whole other side of positive or this other side of psychology. Um, and they don't interfere with each other, right? And the idea that it's a continuum of traditional psychology and then moves into, you know, how do you fix what's wrong? How do you heal where things need to be healed? And then this other side of the spectrum that we had never previously looked at is what makes people thrive? What makes, what makes life worth living? What's, you know, I look at it as a science of potential. And so I kind of really dove into that, um, that whole world of thinking and been, you know, with my work for, oh gosh, I don't even know, like 18 years with clients around coaching and team and team and performance and, you know, leadership consulting. It just, you know, I, I wanted to put into a process and in full transparency, I'm not very good at putting things into processes. I'm very good in the moment. So it was one of those things where I'm like, I have to get this out of my head and build it into a replicable process that, that doesn't have to come straight from me to, to a client. So that's where it came from. And the spark brilliance is, you know, it begins with you. How do you spark brilliance in yourself? And it begins with you to spark brilliance with others, right? And you are the light as the leader that sparks the light in everyone else. So there's the opportunity and the privilege that you have as a leader, but it begins with your own. And one of the things that you mentioned in your book is people are the point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would love to hear what your definition of leadership is. Oh, 
That's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that question about my definition of leadership. I might come back with a different answer if you asked me in five minutes versus a half an hour versus a year. Um, But I think in the moment, I feel leadership is kind of what I was saying a little bit before is, is the opportunity and the privilege to bring a group of people together, spark their brilliance and create something wonderful, right? Create results, create an impact. You know, one plus one is greater than two. And I think you as the leader, by tuning into people and lifting them up in the way that shows them value and respect, you create results. And those results are what are going to make the greatest impact. And, you know, one of the things that really, you know, when people come to coach with you and I, there was some really rich examples. So those of you who are listening or watching us, there's some really rich examples of leaders being stuck or they had been, had sure footing and they were on a trajectory. They got to where they wanted to go, but at some point they lost their footing. And when they lost their footing, they weren't able to see the opportunity that exists. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious, Jackie, how do you get your clients to shift to be able to see opportunity and potential in the struggle? You know, there's so many different types of struggle and so many different types of stuck. And so I think it really depends on the person. But for example, when, um, There's the type of stuck that I've seen where, you know, with these high achievers, they get on a path and you go so fast and it's like, tick the next box, tick the next box, move up my career. What's next? When's the next promotion, right? You've, you've seen probably dozens, if not hundreds of people in the same boat. And then you get to the top of the ladder and you haven't paused to look around, right? So you get to the top and then you look around and you say, oh no, I don't love this view right? So there's that kind of stuck where you realize you worked so hard and so fast for so long to get to a point that you might not love. And so I've worked with people at that point where they're at the top of their ladder and we have to figure out what lights you up, what fulfills you. Let's, let's reflect and see what kind of shifts, what kind of course correcting, what kind of recalibration do we want to do? And it doesn't mean, you know, leave your whole career path, but it's how do you infuse what really brings you joy into what you're doing or where do we make some shifts along the way? So that's one kind of stuck. And you know, when it comes to that stuckness, like you said, it does come in many forms and it can be as simple as tapping into what brought you joy. Cause that's often where we need to go back to is where was that? Why, why yeah. did we go to where we were? And, you know, one of the stories that you shared um, was about missing that connectedness, that they were a very much a social, you know, um, connected with individuals on their team. And then suddenly, as they climb up the ranks, you're, you're more of the lone ranger, and you don't have that same culture. Right. And how do you bring that alive? Right. And they're, and, you know, with the the traditional culture, it's, you know, it's a triangle and there are fewer and fewer positions. So these people that are your peers and your counterparts and your, your friends, right. In in terms of a workplace, all of a sudden you're vying for the next spot against each other and it gets fewer and fewer and fewer. So just by the nature of organizations, it becomes a little competitive and, and you, sometimes you can't help but feel that and you feel isolated. And so many people have reached out about connecting to that particular story. They're like, I feel like you wrote that story about me, that feeling of being alone and not having people to share things with and vent to and trying to make bounce things off of. And, and then what happens is when you feel that stress and you're you know in that culture of mistrust or loneliness and um, anxiety around all of these things that come with it, and you lose that spark, what happens is it trickles down to your team, right? And then your team feels that, and then the burden adds on, right? And it becomes this vicious cycle where you're like, gosh, now my team isn't inspired and they're disengaged and all of those things. And it just becomes the cycle. And yes, in that particular um, situation with that client, she, she's like, I'm out. I can't, I can't do it. And she was like the sparkliest woman. And she was at that point where she was just, she was just so deflated and defeated. And 
that it begins with you, right? Like, here's your opportunity, right? The thing that she didn't want to hear, just like you said, like another responsibility, like I could take on something else. It's like, you know, they followed you there and they'll follow you wherever you go. And so we just had to reignite her spark a little bit and getting her back connected with her team and lighting them up and getting them back engaged and everything shifted. Right. But in that down moment, there is the opportunity because people do follow your lead as a leader. um, And that's proven through neuroscience. One of the things that I found very interesting is that it's not unusual for a leader to hit a point where they're questioning their leadership and questioning whether they should quit. And I Mm -hmm. found that so, you know, relevant as well as I've thought about those moments, too where, you know, you feel like you've given everything, but you're not seeing the same return. So Mm -hmm. I I found, you know, that story of, you know, I think I should just quit. Very fascinating. And with that, when you talk about the golden rule, it helps me shift in thinking about, okay, why would someone quit? And then learning your platinum rule. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh, that's so true. (laughs) We got it all wrong. So I would love for you to tell our audience, uh, what's the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule? Yes. So like you said, it is such a simple shift and it changes everything. I believe it's the foundational thread throughout all of relationships in general, leadership and all relationships in your life. So the golden rule is treat others how we wish to be treated, right? We all know that one. Um, and the the logic in it of assuming that you, Deborah, want to be treated the same way I do and that our desires are the same and that my sons want to be treated the same way I do and that their needs and desires are the same. Like, really? Like, when you think about it that way, you're like, this really doesn't work. It works really well in large societies, mainly around telling people what not to do, right? Um, Like these things are off the table. The platinum rule is the simple shift of treat others as they wish to be treated, right? And to do that, you have to understand, you need to be curious, you need to ask questions. You know, the way that you need support when you're having a hard time might be very different than the way I do. And I can step in with my default, with great intentions and say, ooh, she's struggling. I want to help her. So I'm naturally going to do what I believe would be helpful for me, for you, right? And it might not be helpful at all. And we just make these assumptions, even with best of intentions. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it completely backfires, right? So just shifting that mindset to, how do you wish to be treated? What do you need for support? And just shifting outside of yourself is, I think, the number one way to just immediately elevate all dynamics, much less your leadership. Yeah. And one of the questions that comes up for me that I think about that we don't, I know myself, it wasn't something that was top of mind, um, but for other leaders is what is that other person thinking, feeling, or wanting from this situation? Mm -hmm. And it's easy, you know, to come up with what we do and we default to, like you said, we want to treat people as we want to be treated and we move into that and then realizing that uh, maybe that's not what they want. Maybe that wasn't their end goal. You know, some people might be driven by money. Other people will be driven by significance Mm -hmm. or fulfillment. So to find out where another person's drive is and how powerful that that would be. Yeah, and you know, the simplest thing that we as humans tend to neglect to do is just ask, right? Is just ask, what would be most helpful for you right now? Or would it be helpful if I did this? You know, what can the team do to support you right now? You know, how do you prefer feedback? And, you know, just asking these questions, what about that project really energized you? What about it frustrated you? You know, just these simple questions that we don't really ask, what do you need right now? You know, just these questions and somebody might not know the answers right away. Like, what do you need right now? But they might say, wow, I feel so valued that you even asked me that question and I'm going to think about it, right? And know that you have the freedom and permission to then ask for it next time. And know that there's a 360, like you can start involving that in having that open discussion of having that reciprocal feedback so yes. that you both can learn in the process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. When you, 
when you've had a sticky situation with a client okay who you know might be brought on by their company um, supervisor that they are uncoachable or perhaps thought of as uncoachable and they bring them to you and it's a sticky situation what are some of the steps that you use to help spark brilliance so first it's about understanding who that person is i i believe anyone's coachable who wants to be coachable it's the people who say, I don't have anything to improve are the only people who are really uncoachable. So someone can appear uncoachable, but it's really about tuning in and really understanding that person, what's motivating them, what's shutting them down, what's lighting them up, and then figuring out how, I call it getting stretchy, how do you get stretchy to make progress toward whatever goals, whether the company goals or your goals, or usually the combination of both, of where you need to get to as a, as a leader, um, stretching your comfort zone in ways that feel like you're bumping your head, but we're not throwing you out because everybody grows and changes and has different things to work on, right? Somebody, it might be having a hard conversation. Somebody else, it might be sharing your feelings, like in being vulnerable, right? So everybody has different things that get stretchy. So it's really figuring out for that particular person where do we need to stretch? What does that look like in, in, in baby steps that you can take that don't put you into a fight or flight cortisone mess or cortisol mess, you know? Yeah. Because I, I, I find when those sticky situations come up, it's they need to have that safe space to know that we're not in judgment of them. Yeah. And that there is an opportunity for them to be coached, like you said, as long as they're willing Yes. And they're wanting to be coached. Mm -hmm. And sometimes being away from that other leader who sees them that way provides that opportunity for them to flourish and really be a part of positive psychology work. Yes. And I fully believe also in a strengths focus. And so where we look at somebody who may be struggling in their perception, right, as a, as a leader, whether it's, you know, sometimes perception is harder to fix than reality. And so when they're struggling with, with that, we look at where are your greatest strengths and how do we use particular strengths to minimize the challenges? Because it's so much easier to say, let's do more of this than don't do this anymore, right? You need to, you need to not do this thing and um, you need to not be defensive, right? So instead of saying, stop being defensive, what we might say is, let's start to be more curious. In when you're starting to feel defensive, ask a question, right? Because that reopens the conversation for a productive outcome. So that's where, where a lot of the strengths focus comes in is if they're like, this person's really confrontational or defensive or this, it's like, hey, let's try this instead. Let's try to do this instead of working on not doing this. Right. And, and that can just alone shift it because it's like an invitation and a welcoming and mm -hmm. it's the change in language of how a leader approaches, not only as a coach, but how a leader approaches a situation in order to help their staff step into their own potential. Yeah. And, you know, one of the most powerful things, um, you know, with the father of positive psychology, Martin Seligman, you, you make it, there's a point about, it's about building a person strong mm -hmm. or an organization strong versus what do we have to fix? Yeah. And one of the things that comes up for me is, you know, there's times when as a leader, we can get fixated on what's wrong and what's missing. And I just want you to expand on like what happens when a leader gets so fixated in that area and how it's impacting their results and what they could do about it. So I love that you asked that question because to me, this is like the coolest part of, of everything in, in the book and all, so much of what I teach. So there's a whole, um, like a theory, a science of emotional contagion. So I don't, have you heard of emotional contagion before? No. No. Okay, cool. So I think you'll love this. Emotional contagion is, you know, as it sounds, it's the spontaneous transfer of emotions from person to person or through a group. And what it is, is our, our amygdala. So in our brain, we immediately in 33 milliseconds, identify and 
take on somebody else's emotions without having any conscious choice around it. So in 33 milliseconds, we identify and take on somebody else's emotions. As a leader, you impact not just the layer below you, but the layer below them, and they impact the layer below them, right? So this emotional contagion, whether you show up positive and optimistic, or you show up stressed out looking for what's wrong, it cascades down whether you like it or not. And a stressed out brain is not solution focused, right? When your cortisol is high, which is your stress hormone, you are not seeing solutions. You're not seeing possibilities. You're not seeing, um, you're not making decisions from this rational brain, right? You're, you, it's blocked. It's effectively blocked. So when you come from a positive mindset and a positive um, outlook or optimistic, you're moving into the solution focused part of your brain where you see possibilities, you're innovating, you're seeing new opportunities, um, and you're focused on that. So as the leader, just the choice of how you show up is contagious and it multiplies and it shifts the entire tide of everyone, not just on your team, but everybody they interact with. So that's where it truly begins with you. You have the choice of how you show up. There are studies with emotion. There's so many cool studies with emotional contagion where you can put three strangers into a room and whoever has the most dominant emotion, the other two take on within two minutes, total strangers, much less people we know. So it's pretty incredible how the optimistic outlook can completely impact everything around you. You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is going to the networking events where you're connecting with people and, you know, you're meeting and there's certain crowds, you're, like you're standing in a group of people and you're like, okay, I got to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another crowd that's like, I just want to spend the whole night talking to these people. They're stimulating conversation and ideas being talked about. And uh, I can see how it could, you know, move not only through the room, but through an organization. And I think about the different communities online, when people are sharing, you know, content or um, exercise programs, how when there is that community and someone's really, you know, jazzed up and, you know, getting everybody all fired up, how everyone else can be like that as well. Yes. I mean, picture it in your house, right? When, when you're sitting at home and you're in a pretty good mood and say like, your spouse or a child comes in and they're all grumpy. Like, what does it do? Like it just bursts, like it just deflates the mood, right? Same thing if you're kind of eh and somebody walks in and they're so happy and so excited, it just spreads that joy and you have that power. And what's really cool from a stat standpoint is Harvard Business Review did a bunch of studies on the impact of a positive outlook on an organization. And they showed there's a 31% increase in productivity 37% increase in sales, up to 50% increase in profits, and a decrease of the impact of stress by 23%. So if you think about, well, then duh, right? Like, oh my gosh, you know, you, it begins with you. You can choose. Definitely. And you know, it makes, it makes me think, you know, we're moving into this new normal post-pandemic Mm -hmm. But I think about the pandemic and how contagious, you know, this virus was. Yep. Now, if we could make it so contagious, the happiness that people feel and the spark brilliance that people feel, that when people are stepping fully into their gifts, how amazing that would be. Oh, yeah. We could all be super spreaders. Exactly. <laughs> super spreaders of brilliance. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Jackie, this has been so rewarding to have you on the show. So rewarding because, you know, I'm biased when I get to read these books in advance before their launch, I get really excited because oh. like, I, it's like I have this secret that I get to share with everybody and I want to spread it around. So I'm going to be super spreading some <laughs> out there for you as well. A uh, couple of questions that we'd like to ask on the show is what is one book other than the one that we're talking about today? that has inspired or impacted you in your life? That is a great question. And it's probably the easiest question you can ask me. So I'm so thrilled you asked me that. It's The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor. Um, he is one of my heroes 
And um, that that book just, again, it reignited a huge spark in me. His TED Talk is phenomenal. I don't know if you follow him at all. Um, I'm so thrilled. He actually endorsed my book and read my whole manuscript. And that was like one of the, like the bucket list achievements of my life. So um, hands down, top book. Awesome. Awesome. And I've read some of his articles in Success Magazine for Sean Acor, um, talking about the happiness advantage. So that's that's awesome. The final question I have for you today is what does it mean for you to live rich from the inside out? Mm. You know, I think for me, that's a great question. Living rich from the inside out. I'm very much someone who seeks joy and a sense of freedom and freedom, even in terms of experiencing my family in full and being present with my kids and present and laughter with my husband and looking for that, those moments of that pure, authentic joy and freedom in how I feel. I think that that's a rich, rich life for me. Beautiful, beautiful. And how can people stay in touch with you? Ah, uh, well, um, Spark Brilliance is my book. It's out now. Um, if anybody wants to read it, I would love to hear feedback. Um, you can email me at Jackie at Insinger Insights. So last name, Insinger, and then the word insights. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, but I don't really do much on there, but um, I'm there. You can find me. <laughs> True trans, all transparency. Um, anybody can email me. Tell me what you think. I would love it. Read the book. Let me know what you think. I'd love it. I'd love to hear. Awesome. And like I said, I've dived in. This is a phenomenal book, rich of examples. And my favorite part is that she refers to as click moments where clients will have those aha eureka moments of something that just fell into place that really transformed who they became as a leader. So I highly recommend this book. I'm going to be writing up a testimonial for you as well, Jackie. It, um, and learning the platinum rule is totally a game changer mm. for, for many you know, to come. And it makes me think of, you know, Paulo Coelho is always who comes to my mind and the alchemist that your words of this platinum rule will move on for generations to come for people to know that if we learn what other people need versus yeah. treat people as they want to be treated, not as you want to be treated, that for sure we will get a lot farther ahead in our leadership and in our lives. Oh, thank you so much. And I just want to say too, The Alchemist was also a game-changing book for me. Um, I, I have it right back here, the illustrated version. Love it. Um, and The Platinum Rule, surprisingly, has been around since gosh, decades and decades. And it's like this little hidden secret gem that you hear passed around in certain, certain things I learned about in graduate school. I read about it and I was like, oh my gosh, this needs to be mainstream. And so hopefully more people will learn about it in the book and just bring it to their lives. Awesome. And where can they get Spark Brilliance? Um, you know, it's on any online bookseller, but um, Amazon is obviously the easiest one. It's there in, in all formats. And uh, yeah, Audible's being being recorded next week. <laughs> It'll be there soon. Sweet. Yeah. And we will be having all of the links to where you can connect with Jackie in the show notes um, so that you ha don't have to go searching or trying to remember. It will all be there for you so you can connect with Jackie. Give her some feedback. Uh, we'd love some feedback about this interview here today as well. Drop a note if you're on YouTube, you know, put it, put it in the comments or, you know, write a review and rating. And I am happy to pass on that information to Jackie or reach out to her yourself. I'd also... Jackie, I just, again, want to thank you very much for coming on the show to help us spark some brilliance in mm -hmm. our lives, to become the leaders that we're meant to be, and to help those that we are leading to become the best that they can be, those exponential that mm -hmm. we can expand on that leadership and ex create extraordinary leaders. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being part of your wonderful podcast and your whole um, series of great um, guests that you've had. So I'm honored to be here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Now for everyone listening, I, again, like I'll put everything for Jackie Insinger on the, in the show notes links there. And when we will have this posted, go on social media, share where you 
you know, listen to the show. We, we would love to see what you're up to, whether you're at your desk, you're at the gym, what are you doing and what are you listening to? And uh, really inspire you to become the leader that you need to be. I'd love for you to go over to my website at www.debrakasowski with an S, that's D-E-B-R-A-K-A-S-O-W-S-K-I. And right now for a limited time, you can get your three-part mini course called Making Habits Stick, where you can build focus and consistency into what your goals and dreams are and make them a reality. As Mohammed Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world and go out and make today great. 